let's consider for a minute the music of what happened to the progressive rockers and the singer-songwriters in the second half of the 1970s and their music and how it changed and, and developed and new groups that came in, new artists that came in in those respective styles. Uh, it's interesting that uh, in the, the groups from the first half of the uh, 70s, the prog rock groups from the first half of the 70s, um, there were some uh, important changes that happened about mid-decade. King Crimson, for example, disbanded in 1974, so we really don't have anything to say about them in the second half of the decade. In Genesis, um, Peter Gabriel, who had fronted the group from the beginning, now left the band after Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. And after a long search for a singer, they finally decided they would use the guy who'd been the drummer in the group, Phil Collins. Well, maybe he'll be able to handle it, but boy, did he ever. I and mean, Phil Collins became, when we talk about the 80s, we'll talk about Genesis and Phil Collins in the 80s. What a big star he became. But by 1976, with Phil Collins um, now fronting the band, they came out with a trick of the tail, and Genesis was basically continuing on, uh, almost without feeling the bump of having lost uh, Peter Gabriel. Peter Gabriel fans won't won't agree with that, but that's pretty much the way it happened, at least with regard to sales and concert life and the sort of the commercial health of the group. Uh, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer were sort of at the very end of their tenure by 1977, releasing two big uh, albums, Works Volume 1, and then the single album Works Volume 2 together, a kind of a three album set. They'd taken some time off to do to solo projects and to work on their own playing and various kinds of things in the decade. This was their sort of last big uh, shot. Uh, Jethro Tull continued relatively unabated. Songs from the Wood, 1977, in many ways their proggiest album, or at least the one that has the most complicated arrangements uh, in it. Um, so Ian Anderson continuing to forge ahead. And Yes uh, is back with an album called Going for the One, 1977, which had, you know, a lot of people, even Rolling Stone hailed as the real kind of return for the band after some time off. Um, they hadn't released any a big studio album since Relayer, which was 73 or 74. They'd brought out some solo albums. They'd toured a lot. They'd brought out some uh, greatest hits or compilations of earlier stuff. Rick Wakeman, who had left the group um, after Tales from Topographic Oceans, was back again. And so the group did a whole, uh, this, had this big album going for the one, big tours, all that kind of thing. Yes, we're still going strong, 1977, 1978. Uh, but what also starts to happen during this time is other groups start to come in who take the prog rock thing and maybe make it leaner, make it, blend it in with blues rock a little bit more. In, in, in a way, maybe more prog um, heavy than what we said about Foreigner and Boston in the previous lecture. Now the basis of it seems to be prog music, uh, prog rock, but kind of making it a little bit friendly or more radio friendly by bringing in more kind of blues and, um, and pop song elements. And the, the two groups that, uh, two of the groups that really make a big difference in this regard uh, are American groups, Kansas and Styx. Uh, Kansas Left Overture, I think, is their fourth album from 1977, a number five record. Check me on that, uh, Left Overture. Um, but the big one sort of breakthrough album for them, number five, as I say, and the single Carry On, Wayward Son, number 11, really brings them to everybody's attention on FM Rock during this period. And then the follow-up album, even better, even bigger, uh, Point of No Return from 1978, number four on the charts here with the song Dust in the Wind. Um, the song that uh, so many people who have bought acoustic guitars have learned to play uh, in the years uh, since. Uh, a number six hit for them in 1978. Styx, coming out of uh, Chicago, led by Dennis DeYoung, um, has a big album, not their first album. Again, like, like Kansas, they'd done a few albums before this, but in 1977, they really hit big uh, with the Grand Illusion. Maybe it's the addition of uh, Tommy Shaw into the group, although I'm not sure this is his first one with the band. Certainly his presence is very much felt on the Grand Illusion. Uh, number six record for them, the song Come Sail Away, um, a number eight record. And both of these albums, both of these bands, Kansas and Sticks, a lot of the kind of keyboard-based kind of stuff, synthesizers very much up front, but great hook-oriented vocals, and the guitars tend to be a little bit more blues rock than what you would find in most progressive rock. So you get a lot more of the sort of heavy guitars, spacey, classic-y sounding, classical-ish, if that's a word, classical-ish sounding keyboards, um, and, then, and then a kind of a sort of pop-oriented approach to the vocal hooks and the song forms that all sort of boiled down into forms four or five minutes long that will fit onto this now uh, uh, increasingly constrained but much bigger world of, of FM rock radio in the second half of the 70s. Uh, 
But, and I know there are some people who've been waiting for me to say this for all the weeks leading up to this, probably the biggest group for pushing progressive rock at the end of the 70s uh, that comes onto the scene of, of, of the groups that are already established is the band from Canada. Yes, I'm talking about Rush from Toronto. Getty Lee, Neil Peart, and Alex Lifeson uh, had had previous radio success with uh, tracks like uh, Fly By Night from 1975, but the big concept album, 2112, from 1976, with the whole side of a record, you know, that was just 2112, uh, is often cited as a real important uh, point of arrival for that band. Uh, they continue on uh, into the uh, uh, out of the 70s with the Spirit of Radio, the, the track from 1980 that was on the radio all the time. Tom Sawyer uh, on the radio all the time, 1981. The the the, the downside of all this for uh, for Rush was that just at the time when they were coming along with albums that had big, long, elaborate kind of songs, radio was constraining and even groups like Yes couldn't get their long songs uh, onto the radio. But they always had these hits that, that sort of permeated FM rock radio. And of course, uh, Rush went on in the 80s and the 90s and even most recently to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to be one of the most enduring bands uh, out of the late 1970s. So let's hear it uh, for Rush. Other British bands that arise in the... Um, the uh, second half of the 70s, the Alan Parsons Project. Alan Parsons had been a recording engineer for the Beatles and for Pink Floyd, did the engineering on Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. He pulls together a group of studio musicians for a series of sort of concept uh, albums from the second half of the 70s. I, Robot from 1977 um, is an important one. Uh, from that period. The Electric Light Orchestra, run by Jeff Lynne, really kind of takes the Beatles songs with strings idea. Um, Strawberry Fields Forever, uh, I Am the Walrus, Glass Onion, tracks like that, and kind of turns it in to their own kind of style. And of course, Jeff Lynne um, is somebody very much respected by the Beatles. When the Beatles got back together in 1995, the three remaining Beatles got back together in 1995. Uh, Jeff Lynne did all the production on the new tracks that they, the two new tracks that they produced. Uh, when George Harrison formed the Traveling Wilburys, uh, Jeff Lynne was a member of that. So very much um, uh, part of the kind of Beatles tradition. The representative album, I would say, is El Dorado from 1975. It was a number 16 record with Can't Get It Out of My Head being the big radio single uh, on that. But really anything after between 75 and 79, pretty good representation of what Electric Light Orchestra was up to. Another group that fits into this, this, this idea of, of, of groups that kind of continue uh, earlier styles um, is Queen, uh, fronted by Freddie Mercury and uh, g featuring guitarist Brian May, who was famous for the many harmonized guitars that created this sort of guitar chorus, very sort of classically oriented and you know, observing principles of traditional voice leading and this kind of structure uh, to make these fantastic uh, guitar solos. The big breakthrough album for them, again, not their first one, was A Night at the Opera from 1976, which was a number four album for them and included the song Bohemian Rhapsody, which has gone on to be one of those songs like Stairway to Heaven or something like that, that, that you know, is becomes kind of emblematic of 70s uh, rock radio. So Queen, of course, going on to have um, an enormous amount of success into the, out of the 70s and then into the 80s as well, uh, bringing together a real eclectic approach to different kinds of styles, something that you see Paul McCartney doing a lot in the, in the, the, the second half of the Beatles career, the late 1960s, uh, putting together, as I say, the Brian May sort of harmonized guitars uh, and some elements of kind of classical playing as we see uh, in Bohemian Rhapsody and other kinds of, uh, of Queen music. Let's talk now about the singer-songwriters, who by now, the second half of the 70s, were mostly fronting bands. When we talk about singer-songwriters, probably the best place to start is with Bob Dylan. And in the second half of the 70s, Dylan was very active, uh, touring in front of a band, uh, the big uh, one of the big albums from that period, Blood on the Tracks, his number one album from 1975, uh, uh, featuring the song Tangled Up in Blue. Uh, Dylan, very much a feature of, of rock radio and the rock world uh, in the second half of the 70s, turning to a kind of um, uh, conservative religious, Christian religious uh, kind of uh, uh, perspective uh, toward the end of the 70s. I, I mention that not because I want to really, I want to steer clear of anything that has to do with politics and religion in these courses, but just to say that Dylan is the kind of artist who will often remake himself. Uh, and you never really know whether the Dylan you're seeing is the real guy or whether it's a kind of a, a, a persona that he's constructed to 
to be able to deliver the songs. I actually think that's, that's kind of the secret, is that the, whoever Bob Dylan is, the private Bob Dylan, we're never going to see that. We're only going to see the face that he chooses to show. So the face changes a little bit uh, during the 70s uh, for, for Bob Dylan. That's why I bring that up. Um, Elton John continues uh, with his success, Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy from 1975, a big album for him with the single, the radio single, Someone Save My Life, a number four single, uh, two songs that were recorded at about the same time, uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and Philadelphia Freedom were never released on an album but were singles. Sometimes if you buy that, if you buy the CD package for the re-released Captain Fantastic album, you get those, uh, I think, bundled in as, part, as bonus tracks for that. So Elton John, has great success in the second half of the 70s. Paul Simon continues with his success. He brings out an album in 77 called His Greatest Hits, etc., where he, he uh, has the song Slip Sliding Away included in that new music included with his greatest hits collection, a number five hit. For me, the most interesting Paul Simon from the end of the decade is the album One Trick Pony. Uh, it was number 12 on the charts, um, released in 1980. The single was late in the evening, uh, number six single. But I think those numbers sound pretty good, but I think it was a kind of a disappointing effort in the eyes of many people commercially for Paul Simon at the time. It was the soundtrack to a movie that he released called One Trick Pony. And the movie, I wouldn't say that it flopped, but it was not, a, it was not the success that he'd hoped. It, it, was, not, let's, it was not a hard day's night, okay? Um, but it, it's a very interesting story. Uh, I think it's a, a very well-made music. He gets some of the, very well-made movie. He gets some fantastic musicians: Richard T., Richard, uh, uh, Eric Gale, um, uh, to uh, Tony Levin, uh, Steve Gadd are all in the band and in the movie. He's sort of touring around with the and the tunes that he does are the most musically sophisticated, in, or at least in a, in a sort of complex harmonic way, rhythmic way. The most musically sophisticated ones that he's done up to that point, they are a really fantastic point of arrival and really sort of put us together with groups like Steely Dan and some of the others who are using jazz elements in a sophisticated kind of, and the players he's got, I mean, they don't get much better uh, than the guys he has on that record and who appear with him in the movie. So that's an interesting one from Paul Simon. The, the other uh, singer songwriters we'll talk about, all kind of, I'm gonna place them all kind of with regard to their regional origins. So we'll have Billy Joel, Jackson Brown, Bob Seger, and Bruce Springsteen. Billy Joel, Long Island, New York, right? In 1973, he has a, 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 an album and a song by the name of Piano Man, which make it onto the radio a lot, kind of his version of Harry Chapin in a lot of kinds of ways, very much influenced by Harry Chapin's style. But The Stranger from 1977 is the big, uh, the big album for him that kind of breaks through. It's number two on the charts in Just the Way You Are, the song which was Hard to imagine since it's been played by so many wedding bands in the past, uh, in the time since, but at the time, it was a fantastically sort of atmospheric ballad, uh, just the way you are, before it turned into, like I said, to a wedding band uh, classic. So Billy Joel, of course, goes on to have fantastic success into the 80s, and we'll return to him again when we talk about that. Jackson Brown, coming out of L.A., um, had written Take It Easy with the, with the Eagles, had a hit with Doctor My Eyes in 1972. His album Running on Empty from 1978 is number three and really sort of launches Jackson Brown in many ways, um, or plays a, plays a role in launching him in the second half of, this, uh, of the decades as a kind of performer in his own right and not just a songwriter. So you've got Billy Joel bringing the Long Island sensibility to bear, Jackson Brown being the Los Angeles or the Southern California uh, sensibility to bear. Bob Seeger coming from Detroit, Michigan, right? His roots in Detroit going all the way back to the late 60s where he had a series of regional hits. Uh, did okay in the first half of the 1970s, but with the album Night Moves from 1977, he became a big star. That album number um, number eight and the title song Night Moves uh, plus the song Main Street were both big sort of radio singles for him. A whole sequence of albums after that that consistently go to the top of the charts and make him one of the most important singer-songwriters of the second half of the decade. So we've got Long Island, Los Angeles, Detroit. We come now to New Jersey. When we say New Jersey, we're almost all also saying Bruce Springsteen, right? Bruce Springsteen has his first big success in 1975 with Born to Run. Uh, the title track itself being a kind of combination of Bob Dylan, 
meets Phil Spector meets the Rolling Stones. Uh, whatever's going on in that, it's a, it's a, it's a great sounding album, but it's not the biggest success that Bruce Springsteen will have. We we'll really want to talk about Bruce Springsteen when we talk about the fantastic success he had during the 80s, but not so bad. Like I say, most bands would, uh, would, uh, would kill to have an album that's as, success as successful as Born to Run, but Bruce Springsteen was, get, was just getting started. Well, as we think about this music, from the uh, from the uh, first half, the second half of the '70s here, before we move on to punk and new wave, uh, I'll leave it to you to decide whether you think this music constitutes a kind of synthesis of earlier things, maybe a further development, but also synthesis of earlier stylistic things, or whether it constitutes a kind of homogenization. Is this an interesting period in which rock music is refined and made um, increasingly sort of lean and compact and lean and mean, or does it become so homogenized because everybody's shooting for the big album that it loses a lot of its original kind of visceral effect? Too many of the sharp corners are sanded down. It's a little bit too radio friendly. It's kind of have been uh, neutered in a certain kind of sense and no longer has the kind of edge commitment and authenticity that it had during the first half of the decade. I'll let you decide whether or not you think it's corporate rock or classic rock from the late 1970s. But for now, let's move on to punk. First, we'll turn to the United States. <laughs> 